football is starting. So it is my favorite time of the year. This is like my ideal weather. My ideal weather is like if it was in the 60s during the day with a light frost at night all year, I would be like super happy. Crisp, crisp apples and uh, um, woolly sweaters. That would be a perfect, perfect, perfect world. So Zach, what do you mean, what's my poison? My beer-wise, uh, hmm. that's a tough one. Um, I drink a lot of sours. Um, it's winter. Um, it's coming into winter. I drink a lot more malty, heavy malty flavors. Um, I like to change it up a lot. Um, so I'm not a, uh, extreme IPA person. Like I'm not a huge hophead, but I, my favorite beer of all time is dogfish 60 minute IPA, which is an IPA, right? So it's a little, I'm a little schizophrenic when it comes to beer. Um, but I've never had anything from Three Floyds I didn't love. So whoever's running things there, uh, it's pretty good. Um, whenever we get done the uh, w these COVID restrictions, um, we had a senior trip, not last year, but the year before that to – Timken Steel and Finkel Steel, and we stayed overnight right by the Three Floyds Brewery. So uh, we had a a stop in there for a couple pints, um, and I hope to do that again. Probably not this spring, but hopefully next year um, we'll be able to uh, we'll be able to do that. So when word comes out. Everyone sign up and we'll uh, grab a pint. So, okay. So, whoa, this is not what I wanted. Let me move this out of the way. Okay. So, what one quick thing I did want to talk about. Why is it? It doesn't like the slide I want. funny. There we are. So uh, I had a uh, couple requests. So I had some conversations with some students um, on Friday and over the weekend a little bit. Um, people who got in touch about homework. And one of the questions that sort of people had was, they're, they felt that they didn't quite have the context for this class. Um, that it wasn't immediately clear the relevance. And I, I thought I hit that pretty hardly the first lecture, but apparently it's worthwhile taking five minutes to to revisit, right? So in that first lecture, I asked, what is sort of the difference between a material scientist and a solid state physicist or a chemical engineer? And the answer I threw out was that we are really interested in this space here, right? This is the classical definition, material science, tetrahedron, right? So mechanical engineers and chemical, uh, 
and chemical engineers tend to be worried about these two, right? Properties and performance. Solid state physicists are almost exclusively worried about properties, uh, primarily of single crystals or small objects like nano, uh, nanostructures. As material scientists and welding engineers, we really care about a lot over here, structure and processing, right? So the microstructure defines the properties and the performance. Right, and our processing is how we tune the structure. Right, and, and what is the structure that we're interested in? Right, the structure has to do with, is it crystalline or amorphous? Right, is it, what are the grain size? Right, what phases are present? Because all of these things explicitly affect the properties, right? And processing is how we get to that structure, right? And that's, that's the key thing that we, we're here, right? We're understanding the fundamental physics of how what we do to the material alters the structure, right? As engineers, the chemistry is sort of fixed, right? Yeah, we're going to be looking for new chemistries, right? But we believe strongly in, in both, you know, nature and nurture, right? Here, right? The physicist might, you know, claim that the, the, the material is done as soon as it's born, right? We say forget that. What you do to it after, right? You wouldn't expect a child who was abandoned to a crib and never had a lot of interaction with, with parents uh, to grow up in the same way as a uh, child who was loved and had a lot of different experiences, right? And, and even if the, ge the genetics are the same, it's exactly the same, right? We can't get the properties and performance out of our materials that designers require unless we we really are able to optimize our structure through tailored processing, right? And that is the heart of this class, right? What is the, th the, the theory that we can do? What is the things that we can do? How are, um, the inputs that we give a material, how does it affect the structure, right? And there's fundamental, there's fundamental material physics that we have to get a handle on to be able to talk about that, right? And the focus of this class is on that physics, understanding our inputs to our structural outputs, right? And we're going to be a little lean in the deformation processing of of things, right? But that's really only applies to metals, right? Our focus here is on things that are relevant for every material system. Everything we're talking about applies to polymers, to ceramics, to single crystal semiconductor devices as it does to metals for the most part, right? Um, all right, so these are some slides. Right. You know, so if we look at stainless steel, we know we know our material is not homogeneous. Right. A lot of people have spent a lot of time trying to optimize these phases. Right. Optimize the composition to give us to be able to give us this 
microstructure to give us the properties that we want. And so how do we go about doing that, right? This is, right, the same sort of thing, right? And microstructure is natural materials, right? Right, we see these beautiful intermetallics in in some metals, right? So, you know, the metals that we use are really composites, right? These are, are, huh, I didn't realize that's duplicated. I wonder what's under here. Nothing, okay, right. So these are really com composite structures. So I just wanted to throw that back out there because it's easy to get, uh, Oh, I don't care if PowerPoint records. Okay. Um, it's easy to get lost in the details, right? Lost in the mathematics without sort of remembering why on earth we're looking at these things. Okay. So we left off and we were talking about... Um, solidification of pure substances, right? And we said that the inner the interfaces can be be smooth or rough. If we have a an interface that is diffuse like this, it's really easy for atoms to find places to jump from the liquid onto the solid, right? And we found that um, when the heat of fusion, the ratio of the heat of fusion to the melting temperature is about eight to 10, that we get this nice rough interface and growth is easy and fast. Oh yeah. the. The lecture from Friday is up. Right, it went up. It went up last night. Um, however, if we have a smooth interface, it's very difficult for a new atom to come, and we either have to have take advantage of a spiral growth like this, or continual nucleation at the surface. Then I wanted to sort of differentiate between smooth interface and a planar interface, right? So the rough or diffuse interface means that at the atomistic level, it's crinkly, right? But planar is more of a macroscopic uh, description, right? Is the growth front moving as a plane or is it moving as a some kind of curved surface and growing out? And so we want to express some conditions as to when the two are going to happen, okay? So if we consider a diffuse interface, right, where solidification is fast, right, the solidification rate is going to be determined specifically by the heat conduction. How fast can we move the latent heat of, of uh, that solidification conduct it away from the interface? And we said that conduction can occur both through the solid or the liquid, depending on how it's being cool. And the most, from a most basic point of view, we have a heat heat balance, right? That our temperature gradient in the solid has to equal our temperature gradient in the liquid plus our late latent heat of fusion plus the rate at which we grow, right? So this is the heat can the 
or heat conduction in the solid, heat conduction in the liquid, plus the heat evolved from the interface, right? Another way is we can put all of this on the same side of the equation and it has to equal zero, right? So our conduction terms and our source term, right? So if we have heat extraction through the solid, that means we have some kind of chilled mold right or like ice cubes freezing in a tray right in the freezer we've got cold a cold sink surrounded by um surrounding our liquid right this is also uh a fusion weld right where the the metal surrounding the weld is much cooler than the liquid in the middle, right? And so when we have this, we have a gradient approaching the interface. We have another gradient in the liquid, but right at the interface, we should be very, very near to the melting temperature, right? And if we form a little bump like this, right? What's that going to mean, right? Everywhere on this interface is still at the melting temperature, right? And out here, this temperature is constant and out here, this temperature is constant. So we have a longer distance for our temperature change in our solid, which means that this gradient becomes more shallow and we have a shorter distance from the in our liquid because of this bump. So that means that this gradient becomes steeper, right? And if we're conducting heat this way and our gradient is shallower, that means we're gonna conduct less heat through this bump, right? And the velocity is directly proportional to the this conve the conduction term. So if we're conducting less heat, that means this part of the bump is going to slow down and the rest of this interface will catch up. So if we're conducting heat through the solid, we're always going to remain at a planar interface, right? The opposite is true if we're extracting heat through the liquid, right? So that means here we have a supercooled liquid and we've nucleated either homogeneously or heterogeneously on the solid, right? But now think about what happens if we have a bump, right? We still have essentially a, a shallower gradient in the solid, but we have a steeper gradient in the liquid. We're conducting heat this way. So the velocity of this bump, the growth velocity here is now gonna be faster than here. So this protrusion will rapidly grow into the supercooled liquid, leaving behind this interface. So when we have heat conduction into the cooling liquid, we're going to have a stable interface velocity. And this is gonna grow, this, this protrusion is gonna grow out. So we'll start flat and the growth, you know, will occur something like that. We'll get this, this bulge that then grows into the liquid um, at an accelerated rate, okay? All right, so, I wanna make out the point, chemical inhomogeneity can also result in, in dendrite growth. That's called compositional supercooling. We're gonna talk about that. That's the next, um, the next bit after, after this. And uh, the, that's in the, the reading that's assigned for, uh, um, Wednesday. It's just one section, so don't don't panic if there's only a little bit of time to to do it.
okay? So what happens is, is we get these thermal dendrites, right? So here's our nucleus. We get protrusions that form and they grow out. So these are the primary dendrite arms, right? Then we can get growth instabilities that happen along the pr primary dendrite arms growing into the supercooled region here. Um, so the reading assignment is section 4.3, right? So we get a, an instability that forms on these primary dendrite arms and then we get secondary and then tertiary. So the dendritic structure forms, I think one of the most beautiful shapes in nature, right? Um, so you get a nucleus that forms these shapes. We, these tend to have a very strong crystallographic uh, orientation with the growth directions, right? These dendrite arms tend to be the 100 directions for cubic metals, right? They're aligned with the A, B, and C crystallographic axes, the one bar 100 type directions in HCP metals, right? And so why does this happen? Because of the anisotropy and interfacial energy, right? This is Gibbs Thompson at work, right? These are the directions that minimize the interfacial stiffness. So it's easiest to make a sharp radius. Um, along these directions. So the little bit of difference between interfacial energy along the different crystallographic directions magnified by a tight radius in the Gibbs-Thompson means that we're going to have preferential direction of these dendrite arms, right? So the dendrite arm spacing is primarily in cubic metals going to be at 90 degrees to each other, right? Um, which is good because it happens to be a really good space filling type uh, direction, okay? Okay, so I said before that the interface everywhere is really close to the melting temperature, right here. And that's true for when these protrusion is small. But when we have a tight radius at the tip of this growing dendrite, once the instability has really started to, to take off, now we have to account for Gibbs-Thompson, right? The sharp radius of curvature means that the interfacial temperature is going to deviate from the melting temperature, right? And the amount that the interface deviates is going to be a direct function of the surface energy as we expect and inversely proportional to the radius. So if we look here, right, if this is the melting temperature, so this is the temperature of the flat interface Right, so um, the initial protrusion, so uh, in chat, Connor's asking how big is the protrusion initially, right? So the initial instability is really only a few microns, right? It doesn't take much to kick this off, right? But once the dendrite gets growing, right, it can grow to macroscopic sizes, right? So what's, um, important to realize is that at the tip, the temperature is lower than at, I mean, the temperature, okay, let me, uh, let me be 
be really clear here. Okay. TM is the melting temperature, right? I was going to say something and it could have came out in a confusing way. So let me just back up. TM is the melting temperature, right? T infinity is the temperature of the liquid that's undercooled, right? So this is the temperature of the liquid far away, right? And then TI is the temperature of the interface due to the um, radius of curvature here, right? So the total undercooling is given by this delta T naught, right? The undercooling that we're growing into is this uh, delta TC, right? So the tip at this interface is different than the tip back here, right? Okay, so because of this, heat flow is different in the dendrite compared to a planar interface, right? So heat and also from a planar interface, essentially we have a 1D heat transfer problem. From the dendrite, we have a 3D heat transfer. Use my little, I've got a handy dandy screwdriver, right? This is the, our dendrite tip. We can, we have heat that uh, is coming off um, in three, essentially in three directions, okay? So this delta TC that we showed before is a difference in the interface between the interfacial temperature and the temperature of the liquid far away, right? So if we assume that the uniform is at a solid temperature, right? And it's at, so there is no heat gradient in the solid. There is no te uh, temperature gradient in the solid. So there's no heat conduction um, in the solid, essentially everything is going through the liquid, right? So what we end up with is rapid growth is favored by small, by these, by the small radii due to the greater efficiency as the as the radius gets smaller okay it seems a little counterintuitive at first because i said here the tip of the radius this is actually cooler right at a lower temperature than here so we've got a slightly less uh gradient here, but there's also a lot more, the cert, there's this bright, right, um, uh, sharp curve also means we have a lot more surface area to heat, conduct heat away from, right? So even though the thermal gradient isn't as, isn't as big, it's still very easy to move heat away from here relative to a, a planar interface. So the growth becomes um, uh, accelerated, right? So we know that the delta T is directly dependent on R, right? And as we, we, we know that as the radius um, becomes really, really, really sharp, we know our temperature of the interface is going to go down even farther. So as our radius gets infinitely small here, our growth velocity is going to slow um, to zero. So we know that there has to be some 
optimal radius in between really, really, really fine when we don't have a big enough temperature gradient and really big where we have inefficient heat transfer. So what is that optimal radius to maximize the growth velocity, right? And again, this is not an intuitive result. You have to play with this. You have to work through the equations for this, for this to make sense, right? But if we work through the math and plug everything into the velocity equation, we get something that looks like this, right? We had the velocity is proportional to uh, inversely proportional to R times one minus the um, R star over R. Well, why does R star appear here, right? Because we know that if the tip of the radius gets smaller than R star, it's just gonna dissolve back away. It's gonna melt again, right? Because the system can lower the Gibbs free energy by turning that cluster back into liquid, right? So R stars are minimum possible radius, again, due to Gibbs Thompson from our nucleation theory. So as R goes to R star, our velocity has to go to zero, right? And that as R goes to infinity, our velocity also goes to zero because of uh, um, the poor heat conduction, right? And if you play with this, you see that the maximum growth velocity happens when the radius equals to R star, right? So at if R star, if we plug in two R star here, this just becomes one, one minus one half or one half times two. So this just becomes one and our growth velocity is given by our heat conduction divided by the heat generated from our latent heat effusion, right? So we're in a regime where we're, we're optimal for growth here, right? So again, this is a non-intuitive um, result at first, right? The gist of the argument essentially is we have to correct for the Gibbs-Thompson effect due to the sharp tip of this radius. That lowers our temperature gradient. But because heat conduction is in 3D, we have really efficient heat conduction here, right? So that's, we have one effect that tends to slow growth down, one effect that speeds growth up. So because we have these two competing forces, there's going to be an maximal optimal. There's, a, there's some optimal radius somewhere in between. Right, and that optimum happens to be at two times R star, right? So the tip, what does this tell you? The tip, the size of your dendrite, this arm with here is going to be strongly related to the undercooling because R star is a function of the undercooling, right? So homogeneous nucleation can give you the tightest uh, the smallest dendrites simply because uh, our star is very small. All right? Okay, so that's growth of pure metals. These dendrites, these thermal dendrites here that we see, right, these are very, very rare to encounter, right? 
This only happens in really, really pure materials, right? The freezing of distilled water, right? Five nines, pure metals, right? By five nines, I mean 99.999% pure, right? Or impurities of, you know, one part per, on the part, less than a part per million type, um, type levels. Anything more than that, we're in the regime of alloy solidification, where we get compos uh, dendrites that are due to compositional variation. And the fact that when we freeze and solidify, we reject solute from the solid into the liquid. Right, we reject the impurities out. So these thermal dendrites are very important from a theoretical point of view, much like homogeneous nucleation is very important from a, th from a thermodynamic point of view, but they're never really seen in practice. Right, so that's important to keep in mind, right? Um, so again, really important theoretical concept, not so likely to encounter them in practice, but the opposite is, you know, is, is true, right? The, the, the notion of uh, uh, alloy solidification that we're gonna get started with um, is really uh, super in, in practice, right? Uh, really important in practice, because that's uh, the cases that we, that we see. Um, oh, did I just label things wrong? I may have uh, just labeled the uh, then I, I may have just put the numbers wrong. Um, let me check. But this is this is the next uh, the next one, and in and in fact, the title you can see here it says uh, eleven. So I must have just screwed this up. Okay. Um, so in the previous slide, I had mentioned that uh, spiral growth and surface nucleation were slower, but I forgot to throw this picture in, right? And it just this just shows the growth rate as a function of the undercooling, right? And that at large enough undercoolings, they all asymptotically converge to the continuous growth uh, rate for a diffuse interface. Um, Oh, wow, well, you don't have the contrast on the camera, but there's like a ton of leaves falling outside my window. So autumn is, is really here. Okay, so if we have a single phase, right? Um, in this case, the magnesium oxide, iron oxide uh, system, Right, so if we have this mix of oxides, so we're doing a, an example in ceramics instead of in metals, and we cool down, we have composition changes on solidification, right? The first important thing to really remember is that we don't have a single melting point. We have a range of temperatures that solidification occurs at, right? So that's important, all right? In a pure material, right, we have a single melting point, right? And all of our previous discussion was about that melting point, right? Here we have 
a range of temperatures, but we also have a range of compositions, right? If we come down and we're at 40% iron oxide, 60% magnesium oxide, the first solid that's going to form has a composition of slightly less than 20% iron oxide while the liquid is still at 40%. And then the last solid to form is going to be at 40% iron oxide, right? The last solid that forms here, but the last liquid that freezes out is gonna be way over here at 65% iron oxide, right? So we have to take this into account when we consider how are things going to freeze? How is this going to change our, um, our structure, right? So if we did this infinitely slowly, right? If we did equilibrium solidification all the way across, that means that in the solid, we would have time to diffuse. So yes, the material that just froze out would be at this um, liquidus composition, right? But the, it would diffuse, we would have time for it to diffuse. So the bulk solid composition, the average solid composition would be homogeneous at the alloy temperature at the alloy composition, right? It's only when we solidify faster than diffusion happens that, that we get the composition gradient in our, in our solid, right? If we froze this really quickly, we would essentially have one end, and we did a directional solidification of a bar so we started freezing from one end and froze out to the other. We would have one end of the bar would have a composition out here and the other end of the bar would have a composition uh, out here. It turns out it's even gets even a little more complicated than that and we'll, we'll talk through, right? So let's consider this following idealized phase diagram. Why do I say idealized? Because both our solidus and liquidus lines are straight instead of being curved, right? And specifically, we're gonna be talking about what happens if we have a composition that is less than this X max, right? So we're freezing into a single phase region, right? Okay, so we want to define a pretty important parameter, right? And this parameter is uh, important not so much for a um, any real physical reason, but because it gives us a nice mathematical convenience. And this is, we're gonna call this the partition coefficient. And the partition coefficient is the ratio between the, con the con composition of the solid and the composition of the liquid, right? And when we have a phase diagram where the solidus and liquidus lines are straight, this becomes a constant, right? So if we don't have too much curvature here, this really simplifies the analysis for us, right? And so we can, we can make a lot of nice approximations uh, at, if we do this, right? Again, it's not immediately obvious why this ratio should remain constant, right? So if we think about it, right, these lines have different slopes, but they're both constant slopes, right? 
So this width is going to get larger at a constant ratio, right? And as long as that happens, uh, the ratio here is going to, the ratio of these points is going to remain, is going to remain constant. Okay, so that's just the definition of the partition coefficient. It doesn't tell us anything about why it's useful yet. Right, and we'll get to that. So let's consider unidirectional solidification. And here we're going to be considering the case where we're conducting heat out of the solid. So if we're conducting heat through the solid, it means this interface is gonna stay planar, right? So we also know that as we freeze, the composition of the solid, right? If we're in this region here at the beginning part here, the composition of the solid is less than our overall composition and less than the composition of the liquid, right? So if we're doing this very slowly and allowing the composition to equilibrate, it means that the composition of our solid is XS the composition of our liquid is XL, and the composition overall is given by X naught, right? Which means that the, um, it which should be really obvious when we need Boltzmann's, the Boltzmann coefficient and the partition coefficient. Yeah, um, I didn't make up the notation I tried to keep things standard wherever possible, right? So if it's in an exponential, it's probably Boltzmann. If it's in the exponent or the power, it's gonna be the partition coefficient, right? But it'll be really clear from the, con the constant. Um, or it should be really clear from the, um, Context, context is the word I'm looking for, right? So from, is, from a conservation of mass point of view, we're not creating or destroying any solute, right? Our atoms of our alloying elements are not going away. Um, and we have no nuclear reactions transmuting them from one uh, element to another. So, what that means is that any solute that is rejected from the solid into the liquid has to be balanced by an increase in concentration of the liquid. So that means that these hatched areas have to be equal, right? So there's a balance of compositions that has to happen here, okay? So Let's look at three different test cases for this unidirectional solidification that are of, of theoretical importance. The first is infinitely slow equilibrium solidification. And this is, we talked about this a little bit and we're gonna be a little more formal about it. Okay. Then the second case is solidification with no diffusion in the solid, but perfectly perfect mixing in the liquid. So one way to think about this is infinitely fast diffusion. The welding engineers know, of course, we have other forms of mixing. We've got convection and several different mechanisms of convention that are occurring in the liquid. We're not going to talk about them specifically. We're just gonna say that out here, this composition becomes homogeneous really, really quickly. And then the third case is what happens when we don't have perfect mixing in the liquid, but we have diffusional mixing in the liquid, right? We're not going to, um, we're not going to, to really discuss too much in detail what's happening with the mixing. Like what are the specific mechanisms? Um, we'll talk about those when we talk about diffusion and the convection stuff you'll get from um, 
Professor Wong in heat transfer, heat and mass transfer. Uh, but I just do want to say that diffusion in the solid is very slow relative to the liquid, right? Diffusion in the solid, the main mechanism of that is vacancy diffusion, right? Um, so these are not necessarily bad approximations, right? And in fact, it's the second case where we'll develop the, Sh the Scheil equations um, to describe what's going on, right? And these, these Scheil solidification equations are one of the, the things from the first lecture where I said are the really important things that you have to memorize. So the common tangent construction and the Scheil equations are the first two of that that you'll hit. Okay, so let's, let's consider the case of equilibrium solidification and then we're gonna stop here for today. Right, so we have a composition X naught that we're moving from fully liquid. We hit the liquidus line. The mixture then begins to solidify at composition T1. Right? So where the partition coefficient is, I mean, uh, sorry, composition at T1 X S here. So at this temperature, the, the composition is equal to our partition coefficient times our um, initial composition, right? Because our liquid here is still at X naught and our partition coefficient is the ratio of the solid divided by the liquid composition. So from that, we can see that at our T1 line here, the composition of our solid is just our partition coefficient times our average composition, right? Remember, it's always true that the composition of our solid, right, is going to be our partition coefficient times the composition of our liquid, right? That's always true. That's just the way the ratio works, okay? So if cooling is slow enough, right, we have diffusion in our solid. So, right, as we move down, the composition of our solid becomes more solute rich, right? But this line moves up uniformly, right? If we didn't have diffusion, we would start out here at a small, a very small amount of solute and move up in a per parabola. But because we have diffusion in the solid, this line stays flat and moves up and down as a vertical line. Okay. So the so as we cool down, the solid composition is always going to be given by the solidus line. The liquidus composition is always going to be given by the liquidus composition. Right. And so that As we completely freeze out this line here moves from our initial X naught times K somewhere down here and will move up until it hits the X naught line when solidification is complete, right? The liquidus line, on the other hand, will always be higher than X naught. And as we freeze out, the last bit of liquid to freeze is going to be out here. Right? It's going to have composition X naught over K. 
right? So, but once it freezes, then diffusion takes place and is homogeneous, right? We're going to, to diffuse everything homogeneously and we're going to have in the final case for equilibrium solidification, a bar that has uniform composition X naught, the same as the liquid, right? did before it froze, right? And that's what happens when you do everything slowly, right? You can see that when we do things quickly and we don't have time for diffusion, our composition across the bar becomes quite different. And we'll talk about why this and how this shape comes from on Wednesday. Okay, so, so, yeah. So at, we have in the case here, uh, way at equilibrium solidification, everything happens slowly. So we have diffusion in both the solid and in both the liquid, right? Right, so without diffusion happening in the solid, right, the last liquid is going to get more and more, the liquid's gonna get more and more concentrated, right? And we're sort of at a weird um, point. The very last bit of liquid is more concentrated than the solid it needs to form, right? So that means only a little bit of solid's gonna form and the last liquid's gonna get even more concentrated if we didn't have any diffusion away, right? Which would imply that there would always be a tiny little bit of liquid that becomes even more and more and more concentrated. And so that the last tiny little bit of solid that would form would happen at this X max and the last bit of liquid to freeze out would be at this eutectic composition, right? But in the case of equilibrium solidification, things happen slowly enough that our increased solute here in the liquid can diffuse into the solid to keep this homogeneous, right? So we constantly are moving solid from here or solute from here this way. So if we're doing this incredibly slowly at equilibrium conditions, then we, we don't need to worry about how concentrated this, the solutes in this liquid becomes. So I, I hope that answered your question, right? So think about it and hit me up offline if, uh, it, it, if it's still a little unclear. Okay, sorry, I ran a, a couple seconds Huh. Okay, so I will immediately, let me, let me fix that. I will add, uh, obviously it didn't get assigned to the playlist properly. So let me fix that up on YouTube uh, real fast right after the, the lecture. Okay, take care. Oh, that's just a spider plant. It needs to be repotted. It's a little, um, uh, a little overgrown. Okay, so take care everyone.